you want to know something really cool? What? The woman who directed this was the second female director in Japan, like, ever. Yeah. Wow. That's insane. Want to know something else? I want to watch the movie. She was also the only woman directing films in Japan in the 1950s, period. And she acted in over 200 films. What? That, that's incredible. What's her name? Kaneo Tanaka, what a badass. Facts. Homegirl started acting when she was 15 and didn't stop until a year or two before she died. She got started really early. Yep. She was born on November 29th, 1909 to her father, Kumikichi, and her mother, Yasu, as the youngest of eight. That couldn't have been easy. Nope. Her father died when she was in elementary school, which disrupted her schooling and her family struggled a lot financially, so she was in a position where she kind of had to find work somewhere. She made her first appearance in the entertainment industry in 1919 with the girls opera in Osaka's Rakutenshi. She'd been taking biwa or Japanese lute lessons for some time and rumor has it she really brought down the house. <laughs> and in 1924, she was hired as a film actress by Shochiku Studios and made her on-screen debut in Genroku Ona, which literally translates to woman in the Genroku period. I wonder where they got the name from. <laughs> Beats me. It wasn't long before Hiroshi Shimizu, a promising young director, selected her for her first leading role in Mura no Bukujo. She fell in love with movies at a really young age, so it made a lot of sense for her to go in this direction. Why haven't people heard of this woman? What did you just call her? A uh, woman? There you go. It do be like that. You're telling me. <laughs> Things really started picking up for Kanuya when she started to participate in Japan's first successful talkie, Madumo no Nuyobo. Over the next few years, Kanuya kept pumping out the hits with The Dancing Girl of Izu, Okotu and Sasuke, and one of her biggest splashes, Aizen Katsura, which was actually made into a series. And in 1940, she was cast in Nanina Ona, aka A Woman in Nanina. A truly striking title. Who did she play? The Woman in Nanina. Nice. What really made this film a triumph for Kinyo, though, was working under the director Kenji Mitsuguchi. Mitsuguchi was notoriously challenging to work with, but Kinyo lived up to each of his demands, so much so that he continued working with her for another 10 years. They were a serious power team. And I know what you're probably thinking. Romance, baby. Drama bomb. <laughs> right. But no, Kinyo was her own woman. Here's a quote from Tanaka 1997. Tanaka often said that she chose to marry cinema, a catchphrase that expressed her passion, but that also reflected the social expectations upon Japanese women at the time. The only romantic relationship she had that can be corroborated was with director Hiroshi Shimizu for a few years in the late 1920s, but that didn't last. Kunio did not need or want a man. Anyway, her early acting work was widely respected throughout Japan. She had a history of playing roles that the public deemed representative of true, authentic Japanese culture. She was such an influential figure that she was chosen to be an international goodwill ambassador. She went on the whole, a whole tour of the eastern U.S. for it. It was really awesome, until she got home. She came back wearing things like furs and red lipstick. She was having a blast, and she blew a kiss to some spectators at a parade. Her people felt betrayed by how Americanized she seemed, and that kiss was the nail in the coffin. The media tore her apart and started calling her a panpan. A uh, panpan? It's the Japanese term for prostitute. Wait, is that why later on so many of her characters were prostitutes? Yep. After these events, her career took a serious hit. Still, she felt kind of a kinship with prostitutes of Japan after all the scrutiny she faced and started playing them in films. The rumors and hate spread by the media at the time, along with the difficult conditions she was working under, had a pretty severe impact on her mental health. One of Tanaka's co-stars in the 1950 film The Munakata Sisters has recounted that Tanaka was struggling with depression and low self-esteem during the shoot, and that she had said at one point that she, quote, often felt the urge to jump off the cliff beside her house in Kamakurayama. 
Tanaka had a notoriously wide range when it came to the characters she played throughout her acting career. And not only did she represent a wide variety of people as an actor, but she also made films about a lot of different people during her time as a director. It's true. From 1953 to 62, Kaneo Tanako directed six feature films. Her first, Love Letter, followed a man who, after World War II, got a job writing love letters for other people. It's important to note that she was more or less the only woman on the entire crew, so despite directing the film, many people still consider Love Letter to be heavily male-influenced. Which, you know, is fair to the extent that it was her first film in the director's chair and the writers were both men. Even her second film, The Moon Has Risen, released two years after her debut, was made exclusively by men, save for Tanaka as the director. The difference, though, was that the film featured more women. Right. The Moon Has Risen was about a widower and his three daughters, and the relationships those daughters found themselves involved in. But that wasn't all there was to it. The three sisters, as well as the men they were developing relationships with, were written as allegorical figures depicting the way society had been changing after the war. Kaneo Tanaka's third film, The Eternal Breasts, was arguably her best. With two films already under her belt, Tanaka was able to give a platform to other women in the creation of this film. That's right. The screenwriter for The Eternal Breasts was also a woman, Sumi Tanaka. No relation. Tanaka is basically Japan Smith. Right. <laughs> anyway, The Eternal Breasts was about a mother of two who splits from her husband. She's great at poetry, but doesn't realize how talented she is. As she gains notoriety as a poet, she's diagnosed with breast cancer and loses her breasts. It's an incredibly powerful film. And you can tell when you watch it that it's a portrait of women made in part and centrally by women. It's poignant, artful, and explorative without being exploitative, which can often be the case when men create art that centers in some way around women's bodies, the way the eternal breasts does when the protagonist Fumiko loses her breasts. Tanaka's next two films, The Wandering Princess and Girl of Dark, released in 1960 and 61 respectively, also had female screenwriters. Not only that, but they were also based on works that were previously written by women. The Wandering Princess was based on a memoir, but Girl of Dark, certainly the more remarkable and highly praised of the two, was based on a story by e Eternal Breast screenwriter Sumi Tanaka, though the screenwriter for this film was Masako Yana. Girl of Dark addresses a sweeping ban on prostitution that hit Japan in the 1950s. At this time, if women were discovered to be sex workers, they were sent to reformatories. The film's protagonist, Kuniko, is one of these women, and we follow her as she tries to start a new life for herself after her discharge from one of these reformatories. Girl of Dark is the one Tanaka film that contests the eternal breasts for the title of her best film. Regardless of where it falls in the hierarchy of her work, its importance to Japanese cinema as a whole cannot be understated. For sure. Girl of Dark wasn't just a feminist piece that examined women as something other than sexual beings. It was also the first film to feature a gay woman in Japanese cinema. It also fostered a nuanced discussion about women as a community of people, how we outcast each other versus how we build each other up, and the value that exists in a female collective space. Kaneo Tanaka was responsible for so many milestones in the world of film and she deserved so much better than she got during her life and after her passing. Tanaka's last film as a director was Love Under the Crucifix, released in 1962. It was about a Christian tea master and his daughter who falls for a married feudal prince, also a Christian, and what happens to them after the shogun bans Christianity. Like we mentioned a little while ago, Kaneo's acting career didn't end with her directing career, so why did she stop making movies? The answer is about as frustrating as you would expect. People just stopped going to see her films altogether. Uh, that, that doesn't make any sense. Her, her film directing work only got better with each movie that she made. Why did they oh, stop? Oh, but it does make sense, Frank. I raise you sexism. Oh. Mm -hmm. When Kaneo first started making films, people flocked to the theaters to see her films. In fact, Love Letter and The Moon Has Risen did quite well in the box office, but people mostly came to see them just because they were fans of Kaneo's acting career. So they saw them as spectacles rather than the works of art that they are. Instead of wanting to see her films because they were good movies, they thought, oh hey, this actress I really like is making a movie. This ought to be interesting. Exactly, and because she was just warming up with her first two. And because there were so many 
men involved. No one stuck around to see what she became. It's really tragic. I can't help but wonder about what other masterpieces we may have gotten if Kaneo received the support and recognition that she deserved during her lifetime. I'm with you there. After her sixth and final film, Kaneo went back to acting for the last 15 or so years of her life. And she kept killing it! <laughs> Critics thought her career would die down as she aged, but her hustle never stopped. She acted in another 17 films before passing away in 1976 from a brain tumor. And two of those films were made during that year. In 1974, just before her death, she won a Silver Bear for Best Actress at the Berlin International Film Festival for her starring role in Kei Kumai's Sandakan No. 8. The film industry and its audiences owe an adept of unpayable gratitude to Kaneo Tanaka for pushing the boundaries of women in Japan and on screen all over the world. She may not have received the recognition she deserved in her lifetime, but that doesn't mean we can't honor her memory by teaching ourselves and others about her impact. And with that, we can finally say that we know her name. Kaneo, Kaneo Tanaka. Tanaka. Thanks so much for joining us on this episode of What's Her Name? Tune in next time to learn about another unstoppable woman in film. I've been Frank. And I've been Alessandra. And the only name you should remember is Kaneo Tanaka's. We'll see you next time.